Frank's Nick. It's really good to be here. I used to come here regularly for uh, Levers of Manchester, and I see Jones there. And um, I'm just going to not tell you now that I'm not going to talk about Brexit. Oh. But I've got a lot to say on Brexit. So if you want to ask any questions. But I've got a lot to say on a lot of things. So I have struggled with what to focus on. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the dilemmas of being a legislator. That sounds dull, doesn't it? Right. Um, because that's what I am in the House of Lords. Obviously, I'm not a natural baroness. And one issue that I found really difficult when I went in was the arcane language. I mean, I couldn't really follow why people were saying certain things in particular orders. It wasn't the normal everyday language we use. Anyway, after a little bit of time, I was really pleased with myself, so I kind of made a speech in which I kept saying, the Honourable Lord, the Honourable Baroness and everything, I sat down, I was really chuffed, I thought, I've done it. And then I got this email saying, no, dear Baroness Fox, it's not Honourable in the House of Lords, it's, it's noble in the House of Lords. So that was a bit humiliating. So the next time I went up, I basically got it right, I said, my noble friend, my noble this, my noble that. And then I got an email saying, no, you haven't got any friends, which of course <laughs> <laughs> might well be true. But actually it's because you can only call my noble friend somebody who's in the same party and I'm non-affiliated, so I didn't actually have any nobles. I got that bit wrong. Anyway, and so it went on. I didn't know you had to say the noble prelate for a bishop, so I said the noble bishop, but that's not right. Anyway, there's a prescribed way of talking. It's all very arcane. I've now got I'm a dab hand uh, these days. But actually... That whole feeling tongue-tied made me reflect on language. And actually, I want to talk about language tonight and feeling tongue-tied, but in a different way. <coughs> because quite early on, when I got into the House of Lords, there was, I thought I wasn't a very popular choice, let's put it that way. Uh, there'd been, what one can only say, a you know, pretty savage media campaign about me getting into the House of Lords. And I managed to, you know... The fact that Boris Johnson gave his brother a seat in the House of Lords at the same time, Joe Johnson, that didn't get much of a mention. The fact that Lebedev became Lord Lebedev, and that didn't get much mention, but no, I was the one they went for. So I was self-conscious, to say the least. Um, and uh, there was this nice piece of legislation, which I thought I could speak on, which was on a maternity bill. And I thought, brilliant, you know, this is pretty safe territory. <coughs> I will be for uh, maternity leave. For women, I mean, what's not to like? You know, I can make a nice speech, establish my credentials in terms of women's rights and stuff. And then the problem was that then what happened was I read the piece of legislation and realised that here we had a maternity bill that didn't mention the word mother or woman <laughs> anywhere in it. Because it was a piece of legislation that had been through what we now know is going on behind the scenes everywhere which is effectively the erasure of the word women or anything relating to biological sex. But this was a maternity bill, so it was particularly bonkers. <laughs> and of course, as soon as I realised that, I, my heart sank. I put my name down on the list to speak and I immediately wanted to cross it off. Because the truth is, cancel culture can make cowards of us all. And I was trying to speak <coughs> on this piece of legislation as a kind of popular way of breaking into the House of Lords, and then I was going to enter into the most unpopular toxic <laughs> debate in the country by coming out as gender critical in the House of Lords, and I didn't know how I was going to go. Anyway, that's uh, the way language works these days. It's complicated, and it's not because it's House of Lords arcane language. But the other dilemmas of being a legislator can also centre on language, but maybe something a bit more. The, the one thing to say to you is, the government makes too many laws. Yeah. Like, I can't begin to tell you, I mean, you can't but move for a social problem being turned into a law to ban it. Mm -hmm. There are lots of problems in this country and challenges, but legislation isn't always or usually the answer to it. And it seems to me as though laws are used to substitute for moral political leadership. Mm -hmm. And that gets us into all sorts of problems. But it then gets even more complicated when you actually read the laws. So I have been a great critic of uh, Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil because the form of protest that they've deployed is not the normal democratic protest, as you know. It's, been, it's, it's, it's a tactic 
to intimidate people into agreeing with them. Completely anti-Semitic. They say that. It's as disruptive as we can make it so that because you won't listen to us and we can't win any arguments and we don't get elected, we're going to force you to agree to cut down on the use of fossil fuels. Now, this is a difficult dilemma for me because I'm a big pro-protest person, big, uh, you know, the right to protest, fundamental democratic right. So what's it going to do? But the, the, the government say we're going to bring in specific laws to deal with Extinction Rebellion and just stop oil. But the problem is... There's no such thing as a law to deal with them. So they bring in the public order bill, and you've got this dilemma. If I talk to anyone, they'll say, I support that law to deal with Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion, because that's what they've read in the newspapers. But what I've read is the actual piece of legislation, and I realise that this piece of legislation is not going to be used against Just Stop Oil on their own. It's going to be used against anyone who has a demonstration. <clears throat> so recently, there was a massive fight that went on. It went on for two hours. I'm often sitting there for, I mean, I can't tell how boring it is, but anyway, for hours. <laughs> and this massive row in the House of Lords went on about interpreting the difference between what is serious disruption, right? There was this massive argument about serious disruption and what it means. There then was uh, uh, an amendment that would say, that the, in order for something to count as serious disruption, it had to have a significant impact on people's ability to move around. And that was an amendment because the government, who had not ever defined what serious disruption meant, which is dangerous, um, uh, said that, no, they wanted it that it was more than minor. So there was a row about whether we should use the phrase more than minor, serious disruption, or... Signet, or, or I'm forgetting it myself now. The lawyers stood up. They were all quoting precedents from previous times, right? And I stood up and made this point and said, look, it doesn't matter what legal scholarship is being, you know, talked about here. Why I support this amendment for it to be uh, significant is because the people who've got to enforce this law are the police. And the police have got plenty of public order laws that they don't enforce. Your solution is to bring in new laws to give them more powers. And I don't want them to have the power to stop any demonstration that is more than minor in terms of serious disruption, because I'll just stop everything, right? And it's not even that the wording was, not even that it had to cause ser uh, uh, serious disruption, but that it was capable of causing serious disruption. So you could be standing with a group of friends and they could decide that you were capable of going off and causing a serious disruption and arrest you. You can see what I'm saying. And I made the point that the police also have got as much familiarity with legal language as I have, i.e. none. So that basically, if they see more than minor, they'll basically think it's the lowest threshold you can possibly have and they will ban it. Suspicion less stop and search was the next one. Suspicion let now think about it. And the minister to justify this said it's not always possible for the police to form suspicions that certain individuals have particular items on them. In other words, we'll just stop and search everybody, anybody, it doesn't matter. It's not always possible for them to have uh, suspicions, so suspicion less stop and search. And they were bringing this in on the back of public revulsion at Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil's anti-democratic protests. But you can see what I'm saying. When you looked at the small print, when you read the language, you realised that this would not be confined to those protesters. And that what I had to argue for was the right to protest in general and to quibble over the language <coughs> that was going to be used because it was going to be used to criminalise lots of people. In that same public order bill, uh, and this is a sort of unexpected thing that happens. In the House of Lords, the Labour Party had put in an amendment for Clause 9, as it was known, which was to have 100 metre buffer zones around any facility in which abortion was taking place, known as the abortion buffer zones. Now, I don't really want to get into the details of this, but I'll just point this bit out. All of my friends and myself are pro-abortion, which is contentious, but that's the way it goes. They all, most of my friends support the buffer zones because 
they say, I mean, all these people outside with a load of rosaries and kind of holding up pictures of aborted fetuses is a completely unpleasant thing for any woman to walk past. True. But I was worried about the bringing in of a piece of legislation that would mandate that any medical facility where abortions take place would have buffer zones that were police that if you walked in, you would be arrested. With threat of prison at one point, I managed to get that out, right? I actually challenged that and did manage to get rid of the language that basically said that anyone who advised or persuaded or sought to uh, persuade or advise or <coughs> express an opinion or inform or attempt to inform anyone about anything to do with abortion in a buffer zone uh, by any means will be sent to prison for up to a year. So I challenged that. It did get watered down, but when it came back, the clause, which had got rid of the prison bit at least, it was just massive fines, but still, uh, started to say there should be no attempt to influence any person's decision to access the provision of abortion services in the buffer zones. And I said, well, look, don't we live in a democracy? You know the attempt to influence any person's decision to access? I mean, that's what democracy is. We attempt to influence people's decisions all the time, don't we? Isn't that the shame? Now, I don't think that the way that you should influence women who want abortion is by standing outside the abortion clinic. Don't get me wrong. But I didn't want to have in legislation a precedent that effectively criminalise free speech in a part of the public square. And one of the things that I said was, this sets a dangerous precedent. Anyway, only today, or yesterday, the provincial governor of Ontario, uh, Kirsten Wong Tan, um, has decided to set up uh, uh, um, community safety zones. Actually, that's the term that's being used around the abortion zones. They're now called community safety zones in the UK. This uh, Ontario politician in Canada is trying to set up community safety zones 100 metres around anywhere where there's drag, drag, drag queen story times. <laughs> and then lists out all of the things which you will be facing um, uh, uh, to get a $25,000 fine if you say anything homophobic, transphobic, offensive in general, there's a whole list. And this is on behalf of the, wait for it, 2, two S LGBTQI+. Plus. The 2 S are these two spirits. Don't ask yeah. me. Right, don't it's understand it. Not. I mean, essentially, but the reason I'm drawing attention to that is because it was exactly the same language. And she gave a speech and she said, anyone who's trying to influence that? And I thought, God, I've heard all this before. So I'm making the point about dilemmas of a legislator because I never thought I'd be so quibbling over words as much as I have. But when I realise that they're bringing in laws that will criminalise people and could criminalise other people, not just the people they say they're trying to target, I get very uh, nervous about that. I, 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 in general, think that language does matter anyway, and, but language has become confusing. And another piece of legislation that's about to start in the House of Lords is going to confuse everyone is the Online Safety Bill. Now, I mean, nobody doesn't want to be safe. The online safety bill is packaged up as protecting children from cyberbullying, from uh, 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 child pornography, from grooming gangs and all the rest of it, right? I mean, what can you not like about it? Imagine standing up and going, I object to this bill in those circumstances, right? People are going to think you're an absolute nutter. But the thing is, they're bringing in a law which proclaims that it is about protecting children online, but actually 80% of it's aimed at adults and it's going to be the most censorious piece of legislation we've ever seen. And I think, I'm not going to go through the details of that, but watch this space. And, I mean, it's going to get through flying colours. Most of the amendments in the Lords, by the way, to make it more censorious, not less. And very few people in the Lords, even the free speech Lords, are going to oppose it. Why? Because they don't want to be accused of undermining children's safety. So you get trapped in this sort of, I don't want to be called a paedophile apologist, I don't want people to think I'm soft on child porn, and all of these things. And anyone who follows me on social media will know that that's what they say about me, because I made a, a completely naff answer once on one interview where I got it all wrong, because I was trying to say stop trying to use children as a way of censoring adults and, you know, the and so on and so forth. So I understand why people are nervous. But the interesting thing about this online safety bill and 
everybody in Parliament going on about protecting children is. In plain sight, children are not being protected. Safeguarding is being uh, compromised every day. So again, yesterday, at the Easter conference of the uh, NEU, the Education Union, the Teachers Union in this country, they passed a motion to support LGBT, I can't do it, LGBT plus initiatives in schools, including drag queen story time, and inviting LGBT, LGBTQ authors to speak in schools, because these activities would help to challenge, quote, the heteronormative culture and curriculum dominating schools. The heteronormative curriculum and culture in schools. Now, heteronormative is one of those pieces of language that is both ugly, that I can't say, you've noticed I can't get my acronyms right on the LGBT, but if you go into any school, you go into any university, the word heteronormative and the 2SL uh, GBTQI, etc, etc, trips off the tongue of young people in this country. They know it back to front and sideways. All of the sixth formers will stand there and say, but you're heteronormative, as though it's the most natural thing in the world to, to say. And we know that's because schools have become a major battleground in relation to these issues. So the curriculum that should be uh, aiming to educate our young people in the best that's known and thought is now being used to validate every form of sexual identity. And uh, the curriculum content is no longer being determined by pedagogic criteria, but as a means of transmitting, or, or as a means of transmitting academic knowledge or vocational skills, but is actually dictated by a political criteria and the affirmation of an ideology. And I think that the fact that young people are so familiar with the language of that ideology is something that we should ponder. It's already in their DNA almost that they know what language to use. But it's not even about indoctrinating children. I think the language issue causes a wedge between pupils and their parents and the older generation. It's often expressed in the way that young people correct older generations. Do you know what I mean? They'll say, you can't say that. That's a no, non-word, right? Um, uh, they'll kind of give you lectures on pronoun use, on cisgender, on 93 genders and what each <coughs> thing means and so on and so forth. And in a way, that's almost like the aim of it. Somehow, it's the humiliation of adult authority. It's the, it's the rendering of adult authority with young people, i.e. the parents, and it's kind of breaking that apart. And I'm sure that we're all familiar with... Um, uh, the way this works. But I don't know about you as well, but language then becomes, starts to become meaningless. So uh, 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 it develops uh, new meanings. I mean, we'll all remember that uh, period, and you know, I, I know Nick's in the room, as it were, when, uh, when Black Lives Matters became the slogan of the day. And obviously, Black Lives Matters, yes, Black Lives Matter. But that wasn't what we meant, was it? That wasn't what anyone meant. So when you wanted to challenge it, they went, you don't think black lives matter. And it's like, of course I think black lives matter, but I don't agree with black lives matter. And you can think, oh God, I'm absolutely <laughs> What do I do? Anyway, I had this situation early on before it became fashionable. I was giving a talk at a university and this young woman stood up and she said, you need to educate yourself. Oh. Now I have been, you know, I was a further education lecturer for many years and I'm really keen on educating myself, right? So I thought, oh, we're on the same page here. <laughs> so I said, oh, I agree. I think everyone should educate themselves, you know. But this young woman did not mean go to the library and read some books. God forbid, right? She meant re-educate yourself and accept my set of values um, and outlook on the world or you'll get cancelled. And we become coerced in this way into accepting what we know to be a nonsense kind of verbiage that we have to uh, go along with. And that's, you know, every, and we, otherwise we'll be sat on re-education courses, uh, unconscious bias training, where we'll be forced to learn a new language. I really think there is a language war at the moment. Um, I don't know if you've noticed the delight with which some people enjoy correcting your language. And when I, I, I've already talked about young people, but actually, they are the victims of this, not the, not the purveyors of it. 
there's a there's a set of people in society who really do like doing a modern version of correcting your P's and Q's. I mean, there is a new elite that's emerged who basically spend the whole time in a top-down way, ceaselessly, ceaselessly devoting themselves to reforming society's vocabulary, constantly demanding gender-neutral terms, issuing guidelines on language usage, so we have to say chest feeders or people with cervixes, and so on. And they're constantly on the lookout for those of us who use outdated or inappropriate language. And it makes the kind of problems I was having in the Lords of saying honourable versus noble kind of walk in the park, really, because actually that was a kind of harmless nod to tradition. Whereas this is impossible to ever get right. We get trigger warnings on TV and films and so on telling us that there will be language in this that you won't be able to cope with. And it's, all, it's basically saying the old ways of speaking are dangerous and damaging. And this control of language endows those who know the lingo with a form of cultural status and it gives them a certain legitimacy to be morally superior to those of us who are not aware of the new ways of speaking. And it really does say, we are the enlightened ones who've got the right language, and you lot over there are sort of somehow, the majority are inferior, ignorant, uninformed, you need constant re-education. And it really does make us all tongue-tied. I mean, I was on Mike Graham on Talk TV this morning, and I said, Banana Republic. And I then said, Banana Republic, in inverted commas, because I panicked, because I thought, God, I can't, is that what? Will this break some critical race theory rule that I'm kind of like... So we end up self-censoring. It has a chilling impact on our capacity to talk. Now, if you think about what that means in a democracy, it basically means no debate, no discussion. It means we don't think out loud, which is essential for ever changing anything, because you've got to try out mad ideas. You've got to be able to speak as you find to say what you mean and so on. But the cog uh, cognitive, I can't even say this now. Cognitive, get, see, I, in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Two SLG Thank you, those ones. <laughs> the elite, the elite, I'd say that. Cognoscenti. Cognoscenti, that's it. You have to look at me, I'd rather. Cognoscenti, thank you. They recognise each other by using the right phrases, right? They all know each other. Uh, and the language they use. You know, you, when, you, when somebody says sex ascribed at birth, you know, they, they kind of all nod knowingly and the rest of us go, oh God, they're one of them, right? Like <laughs> now, when I was uh, at my brief moment in the European <laughs> Union, uh, one of the things that I really liked about being in the EU was the languages. You know, I couldn't get over the brilliance of having multiple translations of language. You know, you put your headphones on and I was always like, I mean, what? brilliant, you know, he's about barely speak English, and then you get this, and I kept looking at these young translators and thinking what geniuses they were and how brilliant it was that we could all communicate with each other. But I've quickly realised that the, prob the, the, the issue in the European Union was not that one person spoke Polish and another spoke Italian, and because actually they all spoke the same bloody language, <laughs> because they all knew eco-speak, they all knew all about uh, gender-critical language. In some ways... It was obvious that they all felt at home with each other, whatever the language difference is. And I do think we are witnessing the formation of a new elite class who speak the same language and look down on anyone not fluent in the new political uh, discourse. And it justifies a new form of snobbery that centres on language, because you actually uh, uh, basically label people as beyond redemption, redemption, sort of inhabitants of a different moral universe. I mean... It, it's, it's the thing that's really hilarious about it is they, they basically do treat the majority of people who haven't learned the language as like savages. So if you think, I mean, Hillary Clinton's use of the term deplorables, she meant it. That's what gammon means, doesn't it, right? We're all, yeah, the, the, the Neanderthal knuckle draggers <coughs> who can barely express themselves because we haven't familiarised ourselves. And of course we then get the promiscuous labelling of anyone who doesn't uh, conform or doesn't speak the new, the new language. Uh, and they use phrases and terms that are completely dehumanising and uh, slanderous. Like they say that everyone is far right, uh, fascist, uh, 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 Nazi. So, you know, I spoke at the Let Women Speak rally in London, uh, 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 Speaker's Corner on, 
on Sunday, and we know that Posey Parker and Son has been called a Nazi. You know, and that's and what that means is you don't have to even talk to us, right? So on the one hand, they're re-educating us, but a lot of the time they use labels that so dehumanise us that we don't even have to be engaged with. And Sadiq Khan actually recently called those who were opposing you, Les, mm -hmm. uh, 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 as a fascist adjacent Nazis, right? I mean, fascist adjacent, what that's <laughs> right? Right, that's an excuse for me to get onto you, Les. Right, <laughs> that mention of you, Les, I've written down here, is a chance to note. When we talk about shifts in language, um, we should remember that it's not restricted to the culture wars thing. It's easy to have a joke about some of this stuff, right? But actually, there's a whole new vocabulary attached to even the most mundane everyday activities, like getting from one place to another. I mean, the first time I heard the phrase active travel, I thought, well, what's not to like? I mean, travel, you know, that's all right. Uh, I mistakenly assumed that it might be a new transport infrastructure po uh, policy. You know, it might mean, I don't know, more buses, more roads, and so on. And then you find out that active travel is actually about stopping you travel certain ways, and it's all about walking and cycling. And you think, well, what's, how did the term active travel emerge? But there's a whole new lexicon now. I mean, even the fact that I drop you, Les, in, you know what I'm talking about. Um, LTNs. I mean, you know, low traffic neighbour. I mean, what are they? I mean, five years ago, when I said LTNs, everyone looked at me like I was mad, right? Low traffic neighbourhoods that are not about low traffic, although they are about stopping you driving the car. 15 minute cities is another one. And they're often used to gaslight people because. I actually wouldn't mind being 15 minutes away from amenities. Do you know what I mean? If the buses came, I might get there. If there were amenities, I might get there in 15 minutes. I mean, it'd be great with the more hospitals, schools, all the rest of it that I want to access. But of course, we know that 15 minute cities are not about providing ease for us to move around the city. They're a new form of controlling and monitoring individual mobility choices and finding, finding those who don't conform. But it's done through this new language. And this mismatch between language and reality sums up the biggest problem in politics today, it seems to me, which is they speak to each other about what to do to us. And then there's this huge gap between them, even though I'm in the House of Lords, so I do feel funny <laughs> saying this, uh, there's a huge chasm between that and everybody, uh, everyday realities that the majority uh, uh, evidence and, uh, and live with. Um, I, I think one of the problems is the gap can make you feel as if you're going mad. So councils who uh, claim that low traffic neighbourhoods are a success use evidence and data to show that they have cut traffic both inside areas and on boundary roads. But local residents are totally baffled by this because they can see with their own eyes significant increases in congestion around boundary roads. So now at last, the manufacturer of roadside counters that have been used by councils uh, to collect this data have admitted that they don't work, that they were misprogrammed and that they're under-reporting. But one resident from North London, Edith Melvitt, who's a bus driver from Palmer's Green, explained well what I think it feels like to be a British citizen today. He was so suspicious of the data reported by Enfy and Council saying that LTNs were, were uh, working because he... Uh, lived in a con heavily congested road on the edge of an LTN, that he trawled through 24 hours of CCTV to see how many cars, vehicles, actually passed his home. And he said, the council said only 1,845 cars a day pass through my road. I watched the CCTV back and counted 2,523, 30% more. I was so annoyed I was so angry because it made, they made me feel, it's the council made me feel paranoid. It's the gaslighting telling me traffic had reduced when it hasn't. And I really felt his anger and frustration because you're sitting there looking at something like you're looking at a man and they're saying it's a woman and you're going, it's a man. It's a man. <laughs> <laughs> you're sitting in your house with heavy congestion next to an LTN and they're going, we've really reduced the traffic. And you're looking out the window going, you haven't, you haven't. Anyway, it's all been cleared up now because the machines don't work. What's Enfield's response been to all this? They've admitted the automatic counters of under-recorded vehicles, but they've still said LTNs are a success. They're still citing the data, and what's more, the Department of Transport is still using that data to justify this policy. I'm getting to the end now. 
how not to be dispirited. And maybe we can talk about the state of politics today uh, and where next in the discussion. But one way that I think we shouldn't respond is by entering into the language wars ourselves. So when Sadiq Khan uh, uh, was uh, bashing anti-low emission zone protesters as Nazis, on social media, one of my followers branded Khan as uh, the London mayor as a, an anti-driver woke Nazi. Oh, that's not helpful, really, is it? I mean, you know, like, don't give him the... Then somebody else called him a commie cultural Marxist. Now, it might be because I'm a Mar old Marxist that I don't like this, but I just don't think it works. It's basically trading insults across the divide. And I've noticed that in our attempts at making sense of the world, we actually tend to rely on the old political categories, like you're a commie, you're a Marxist, you're a, the, you know, or you're a Nazi, you're a fascist. But actually, I think that, first of all, what's happening today goes beyond left and right. It's a bit like Brexit in that sense, but it's definitely beyond left and right. We're in a new political period. But also, I just don't think that it works to become caricatures of ourselves. I just don't think it's accurate either. Because if you look at something like woke, and by the way, I've avoided using the word woke throughout because I hate that word, but I know it's helpful. But if you look at who are the biggest advocates of woke politics, or indeed environmental politics and eco-politics and net zero, it's huge, massive capitalist corporations. So it just doesn't work to go left, right, left, right, and shout at each other. I also think that it's no good that you sort of go, we're anti-woke and you're woke and we're on the side and we're self-righteous. I just think it's too simplistic. And one of the reasons why it's too simplistic is it misses the distinct and original features of this new ideological uh, form of politicised identity politics uh, that we're living in. I think that this is deep and institutionalised and it's hard to defeat and we're kidding ourselves if name-calling is going to win the arguments. So I do think we have to build a new politics, but I think it's tougher than just name-calling or using their tactics, or if they cancel us, we try and cancel them and get them sacked. I think that's not sufficient. I think we've got to come up with new imaginative tactics. We've got to reclaim our own language so that they don't steal it from us, uh, but we've not to indulge in the language wars ourselves. So I think we've got a harder hill to climb, but it'll be worth it in the end. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Hands up if you've got questions. If we can keep them as questions and not rambling, then get us all. Avi? Um, and, and you can say, if you can speak up as well, please. Universities seem to be at the base of a lot of this. Uh, how much do you think that the setting up of UKRI, which is the funding body for universities, and the changing and removal of the holding principle for uh, funding, which is essentially a quality of opportunity, is allowed universities to get away with a lot of this nonsense? Am I doing one at a time? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I, first of all, I, I'm not sure that I would say that universities are at the... I don't think it's the university's fault, but one thing that has happened over the years that people haven't noticed is that universities are the place in which a lot of these ideas were theorised before anyone noticed them becoming more popular. But there's two problems at the moment, which is as almost, you know, certainly 40% of young people go to universities, um, which in and of itself is probably the wrong uh, decision because these are no longer... Uh, places of great knowledge where they're going to have a fantastically intellectually stimulating time. But nonetheless, what they do do is introduce them to these notions. It's also the case that, I mean, I wrote a book in 2016 and brought it out in 2018 called I Find That Offensive, and I addressed it to Generation Snowflake. I rather regret that because it means Wikipedia says that I introduced the concept of snowflake into the UK. And um, actually, I was stealing the concept from American universities where it was widely being used at the time. But the reason I'm saying that is because I was trying to say in that book that it's not generation snowflakes' fault that they're snowflakes, if you know what I mean. I mean, we socialise them that way. It's our generation's fault. And in many ways, I worry about focusing too much on the universities because they are... Um, they are, that, and people sort of think, oh, it's the university, just close them down and then it'll all go away. Whereas I, I, it's much worse than that, in a way. 
Um, but one thing I will say is, is that academic freedom, even if you're not interested in universities, you're not interested in going to university and you don't know anyone who's at university, is an incredibly important value to defend because it's the way that you can explore uh, knowledge. It's how we make gains in everything from medical science to, uh, to philosophy, to everything, to historical understanding. And so the problem is the politicisation of, of, of universities that means academic freedom is in jeopardy, which it is particularly around gender, but not just. Also around critical race theory and uh, environmentalism is a disaster because you're basically, you've got academics who can't explore without fear or favour uh, ideas. And so they're never going to have any breakthroughs. I mean, we're going to get stuck. Um, and that's a disaster for all of us. Anyway, it's not yeah. sufficient, but... Thank you. Hi, Claire. Um, I'm probably unusual in here, and I'm a socialist. Um, excuse me. <laughs> me, me and you together. You are both excused. So, 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 you dotted around the room. Yeah, well done. What's happened to the left? They're on the wrong side of every debate. You know, the, the left that I used to be in the SWP, and I can't believe how they're lining up with Big Pharma over the vaccines and, you know, <coughs> the Batley Grammar thing. You could li list a, a dozen. What, what's happened? Have they been infiltrated by the CIA or something? <laughs> or... Um, well, I think, well, in, in some ways the left became irritated with the working class because they weren't left-wing enough a long time ago. I mean, they kind of gave up on... on on building a mass movement in the British in Britain for a long time ago, because they kept thinking, well, why do they why do they do stupid things like vote for Thatcher and things like that? And they kind of abandoned being a party. I mean, that's the Labour Party, I know, but in a way, the generally the left, and they basically embraced identity politics. They kind of formed uh, <coughs> well, a, a sense of popularity by kind of going around and picking off different identity groups and sort of saying that's the left wing causes. Now, or uh, that's one group, right? So in a way, the left abandoned being the left, certainly having any roots with working class communities a long time ago. They started to become contemptuous of the working class. And that was best expressed, I think, during Brexit. Because that really was where they... And, and something like Batley is another example, which is, you know, there's a, there's a mob outside of school uh, that, uh, you know, and the teacher's terrified and all the rest of it. And nobody will say anything because they don't want to be accused of being Islamophobic. In fact, if, if, if anything, so the left then have caught themselves up in the trap of identity politics and not wanted to offend any different identity group at any one time. So there's cowardice as well involved in it. And sometimes they know better. I mean, there's an awful lot of people on the left who come up to me and say, I agree with you. And then walk <laughs> off, right? Well, that's no good, is it? Because they're saying they're whispering. Do you know what I mean? Like they're not, so it's not a widespread. The other thing that's that's really dispiriting is, you know, I was involved in anti-racist politics for decades. You know, I, I consider myself to be, you know, one of those people involved in women's liberation. You know, I'm a lefty. Uh, you know, I was on, I wasn't on Thatcher's side in the minor strike. You know, I've been on every picket line. I've done all that. But one of the things that happened was those issues became divorced from, you know, anti-racism historically was absolutely insisting that people were not discriminated against in the law because of the colour of their skin or their ethnicity. Bloody rightly so too, it's that's a backward idea, right? And you wanted to say, but it really was black and white unite and fight. You know what I mean? It really was that everybody got, you didn't, you wanted to not see people's skin colour. That was the point. You wanted to be colour blind. That issue, as we know, has become a way of beating the white working class in this country over the head now. And the left has allowed that tradition to combining their contempt for the working class and an issue which is obviously right on. I mean, you know, if somebody said to me, am I an anti-racist? I go, yes, but they mean, do you support critical race theory? So they've also, and, they, and so that's all that. The other thing that happened to the left, because I haven't got, this is the whole bloody history of the world. No platforming was a left-wing idea. Now, when I was at university on the left, I was actually in the SWP. I got kicked out over there. Yeah, I remember. Right. So, <laughs> this is one of the issues. There was a big no platforming row. And the no platforming row was an attempt to no platforming somebody who was anti abortion, the anti abortionist. Now, probably yeah. because I've been an Irish Catholic, even though I was pro abortion and, and a, an atheist, I didn't like the idea that you were going to try and ban these groups. So, there were, that, that was one thing. 
But it was originally brought in as a way of stopping Nazis speaking. Now you might think, well, you know, Nazis, you've just said Nazis. Let me tell you, in Coventry, in the early 80s, there were bloody Nazis. I mean, gangs of them walking around saying, we are the National Front and chanting racist slogans in, you know, a lot. Firebombing. Firebombing, firebombing houses. And the police would arrest the father of the family that was firebombed as the National Front stood on the corner going, we did it, burn them out. And they'd ignore it. I mean, and, you know, that's what it was like, really. You know, it's changed, right? It's changed as people fought back against it. But the no platforming, as we know, that's brought in, I still think it was a terrible error of judgment. Because rather than saying you would defeat people intellectually, I mean, I don't mind if you go out and, out and bait up the lads. If just, I don't mind if somebody goes out and uh, has a go at the gentlemen who were firebombing people, right? But this was a... Uh, but the, the idea of banning and, and, and not having debate was always an anathema to me. And it just grew and grew and grew. They got used to silencing their opponents because they didn't have the arguments to win. I want to say they, I mean me. I mean, we didn't, we weren't winning over people um, sufficiently, so we got exasperated. So you start silencing your opponents or demonising them. And it made a nonsense of it. And just on my language point, sorry, one of the reasons why I really hate this promiscuous use of the term Nazi or racist or all the rest of it scattered around is that I want to be able to call people fascists if they're fascists. I want to be able to say that's racist if it's racist. I mean, there might be some arguments and... I, I, the, I do think there are dangerous conspiratorial uh, thinkers, right, that I want to say that's conspiracy mongering, it's mad. But if everybody's a conspiracy theorist, if everybody's a racist and everybody's a fascist, and everybody's, then I lose my capacity to actually genuinely identify bigots and have an argument about why I think it's bigotry. And that's one of the most frustrating things, and that's the legacy of the left, who then got excited because they, they're popular. And they're popular with the people who run society. How um, mad is that? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Claire. Simon. Um, I just uh, wondered, what's happening with the bonfire of the EU laws? Because I've read two things today. Mayor Tusi says that it's happening. Uh, Merkel Eber says that it's going to be kicked down the road and not happen at all, in effect, till 2028. Uh, and that the Windsor framework is part of the conspiracy to keep the EU laws precedent over part of the UK. So I think it's with the Lords at the moment, but apparently it's disappeared from the uh, agenda. So what, what is happening and how can we make sure that we actually get Brexit? Yes, I don't, well, first of all, God, how are we going to get to Brexit? Um, I think the Windsor framework and the retained EU law stuff, which I'll go on to in a minute, are not necessarily, they are linked, but they, I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think they brought in the Windsor framework, they're basically, I mean, it's almost like they didn't read the small print, you know, like what I was saying before, right? So they say, oh, we've now got the, what is it, the something veto, I can't remember what it's called, the... Um, break. Yeah, the break, the break, but then you could, you know, the... the, the, the Windsor, <laughs> Windsor there was, break, oh, What's it called? No, it's... What's it called? Windsor... No, but there's a thing, the Northern Irish... Storm, storm and break. So, thank you. Storm. The storm and break... I couldn't think of the words. The storm and break was meant to say to the DUP, you can now stop any EU laws. But then that's the word. That's like we're talking about language. Sounds like that. Two sentences in a thing. Then you actually read the storm and break. You think, oh, no, you can't. That's just a lie, right? It's just a misdescription. Um, anyway, the Windsor framework is a total disaster. I mean, it basically is May's deal repackaged and worse. It, 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 from the point of view of, of, of Northern Ireland... Um, they are going to be part of the EU. That does give access of EU law to the UK. It's not going to be the same as being in the EU, but nonetheless, on principle, it compromises sovereignty. The EU retained law bill, in some ways, is a stupid bill <clears throat> because of this factor. That what they did was they didn't do anything post-2016 at all for ages. Then suddenly they go, oh, God, we've got all this EU retained law. We better do something because we promised we'd do something. So we're now going to bring a piece of legislation in that's going to kind of whiz through it and deal with it really quickly. But they, um, and, and I've defended that, and I've defended the EU retained law bill. But it is true that there's some sunset clause, which is the 31st of December 2023. The truth is, if they haven't dealt with any laws, they'll just literally fall off the statute book. And that could be important things. So there's a little bit of me that knows that they had to give a little wiggle room there. 
But what my concern is that if this is not a sensible uh, compromise. This is the remainers in the House of Lords have objected to this from the beginning because they think EU law is superior. The government have rightly stood their ground. The government have now done the Windsor framework. Within the Windsor framework, the EU said to them, we don't like the Northern Irish Protocol Bill, and they dropped it and dumped it. And then they said, we have some problems with the EU retained law bill, and suddenly it's disappeared off the Lord's agenda. And so I, I think we don't yet know that basically how much of a backbone, whether they're going to still stick with it. Yes, that, that's it. And one thing that people should know is the British state is in no fit state to write laws or bring in legislation. Why is that? Because it hasn't had to do it for a very long time. Because the way legislation happened when we were in the EU, this is kind of like what every Remainer would agree with me on, and there might well be people who voted Remain here, I'm not trying to make that point. But basically, UK law was written by lawyers in Brussels and Strasbourg Often they were British ideas, don't get me wrong. I mean, often it was the UK government and go over to Strasbourg and say, we've got a brilliant idea. Can you write the law? We'll bring it back and then we'll blame you if they don't like it. It was a way of keeping it from popular uh, accountability. But nonetheless, they lost the habit of ruling, of knowing what good law was, of writing legislation and writing it well. And they genuinely are rubbish at it now. They're, not, they're floundering. And so... I don't, I hate technocracy, but I wouldn't mind some competence uh, at the heart of government. You know what I mean? I don't, that's not the same as technoc technocracy, but it does scare me the unintended consequences of the laws they bring in. I don't really believe half of these things. A lot of the time I say to a minister, do you realise if you do this, this will happen? And they look at me and I realise they don't realise and that they haven't read it and that they don't know what they're pushing. And they, and so there's something about, and that's, it's that, inability to know how to run society in the way that we would expect, that they compensate for that by developing this kind of moral high ground authority around issues like net zero and woke politics and so on, where they feel really certain. And also where there's no argument, because they say, we've got these targets, they're in the law, we have to do it. And so it kind of gives them a sense of purpose without actually having any substance to it. <coughs> Thank you. Lady Devet, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to bring up the conversion therapy bill. I'm involved with a group called Thoughtful Therapists, and um, I won't go into big details of it, but I was really interested in what you said about, you know, them bringing laws about something that there's no way there should be a law about. And it, it's, it's, we've been battling with this thing called the coalition, <coughs> who are behind the scenes influencing what's going on. Um, and they're, they're all pro-gender ideology. So, um, so just to form it in a question, um, I mean, um, how can we fight this bill? I mean, it looks like gender identity is going to stay in it. The whole thing is completely irrelevant. You don't need a bill. All those things are already illegal, those kind of practices. They don't happen. Um, and we're watching it just kind of yep. dismantle our profession. You know, it's already, we have constant inquiries. Therapists, psychiatrists are, it's a chilling effect already. Um, and it's criminalising people just wanting to think and explore and challenge. Yeah. So, I mean... So I'm not quite sure my question is... No, I know, I know, but it's fine. I mean, the, the thing, it is a perfect example of a law that's not needed. Yeah. Right, so the thing about conversion therapy is even if you don't, even if you remove the gender conversion therapy, which would obviously be a disaster because it would mean that if a 15 year old turns up and says, I, I think I'm, you know, I, I think I want to be a boy if, if they're a girl, I, I, what, what, you know, if, if anyone tries to say, well, let's consider, look at it in the round and sort of tries to have a therapeutic conversation with them, you will be doing, committing an illegal act. So you have to affirm. So it's compulsory affirmation for, for therapists. Which is, really, which is obviously disastrous and dangerous. This is, this is a conservative government that brought this in. Can I just note everyone, yeah. right, on the left-right question? Conservative. No need for it. Nobody, what are they doing that for? Mad. But even if they get rid of the bit that's on gender, I would be opposed to a, 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 a conversion therapy bill. 
Now they would say, well, conversion therapy without the gender would be conversion therapy of lesbians and, and gays. Now, let's consider this. Are we living in a country in which it is rampant that people who come out as gay are tortured, uh, threatened with hot coals, you know, kind of have their... No, is the answer, right? And if they are, it's illegal. Anyone tortured, illegal. Breaks the law, right? You don't need it. When you actually look at what they describe as torture and so on, it's usually praying, right? <laughs> Adults as well. So basically, I might think it's bonkers, but if you are gay and a member of a particular, you know, church or religion, and that religion says that being gay is a sin, going against God, my instinct would be to leave the church. But some people don't want to do that. Probably adults are allowed to, so it's a bit, it might be a bit bonkers that they stay. So they then think, I don't want to be a sinner, so I want to stop being a lesbian or stop being gay because it goes against God's word, right? And I want somebody to pray over me. Now, we might all think, it doesn't matter what we think. Who cares, right? We, I'm a liberal. I live in a free society, and they go to a prayer group. Anyway, that's out. You'll be, that'll be criminalised. So the churches have come out against it. Because the churches have come out against it, uh, it means that the Stonewall crowd and, and, and all that who were behind it are basically saying it's a far-right religious cult who are trying to, you know, and so on and so forth, right? So, but anyway, I think that anything that says that, that uh, talking to people about dilemmas and discussing them with them and their sexuality, if they want to discuss it, however old they are, I think that once you start criminalising that, it's just not appropriate space for legislation. But never mind young people, even adults who want to choose to take a certain path they can be reported as being converted, and I and and you know of having somebody imposing conversion therapy on them that will be illegal. And the government are not backing off on it because they want to be not accused of being a bigot, and because people say it's like clause twenty eight and they don't want to be the nasty party. They completely walked into this. I just want to say, we have tried really hard to find out who this shadowy coalition is, and we cannot. We have a, so I'll talk about it afterwards. Absolutely, it's just been... Well, they've been working on this for a long time. That's the end of part oh, one. Oh, God, sorry. What? Sorry? I, mean, I spent too long answering. No, no, it's OK. We've we'll, we'll had plenty of time for the questions. So, end of part one. You've got ten minutes, toilet break, get a drink, come back upstairs.